Welcome, my friend. It's a delight to see you and to have you in our private study and studying the Word of the Lord. Uh, we have enjoyed for many years inviting our neighbors into the study and saying, let's open the great book, the good book, the eternal book, and learn from it the precepts of living, how to live before God, how to successfully reach eternity in the hands and the arms of God. So it's a great joy to say, come on in, let's study the Word. For a, a long time, uh, I have been dealing with a matter in my own spirit, and that's where most teaching comes from, you know, right out of a person's spirit. What was God doing uh, when the, the great uh, non-Christian non uh, uh, re religions came into being? And I began to look in the Bible, and I saw the relationships very dynamic. For example, today's lesson with the Babylonian religion, how, how related it was to Noah, uh, how Noah was living right up into that time. And, and so the people knew the truth. They had an opportunity to know the truth. And then I began to see that all religion that doesn't focus itself on the true God is actually against God. And it is a rebellion within. Then I said, well, then the devil is associated with it because the devil was removed from heaven because he would not follow God. Therefore, these religions that we have on the face of the earth are part of the rebellion that Satan has in his heart against God. When we look at the big, the big dispensational chart that we have here to the side of us, we see the whole story and the true story of mankind. And that's important for us to see. Uh, some of us don't have the proper perspectives in life. Here we have a big 25-foot-long chart. It gives you from eternity to eternity. Uh, in, the, in the first place here, God created the heavens and the earth. And in six days, he rested on the seventh day. He began then with a, with a time called innocence. And, and this was a dispensation when Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden, uh, they were innocent. They had no sin related or associated with their lives. When sin came, they fell. And that's this area in here. They fell and lost the pleasure of God, lost the joy of the Lord, lost the presence of God, and then we go into the area called conscience, or dispensation called conscience. And in this dispensation called conscience, uh, inside of man, he was told how to live. He had no written laws. His relationship was a direct relationship with God. This area of time uh, completed and finished itself at the flood. At the flood. Uh, man disregarded God. He disregarded... Uh, now, you see... Uh, uh, here, it was only about 2,000 years, and Adam lived 930 of those years. So Adam's great-grandson was living uh, right at the time of the flood, and so we have a direct relation from the Garden of Eden to the flood. And so there was light there. There was truth there. Men refused the truth. And then we come into the area called a human government here, and, and it, uh, it, it tells us about how man uh, sought to go his own ways again, and in doing this from the flood to the Tower of Babel, which was only five generations, a man again, though, as I'm going to show you today, <laughs> that, uh, and, and this is where our lesson is actually focused in this area today, uh, that, that Noah was living right up until the time he saw this Tower of Babel. And Noah was living when the earth, when the earth was divided into his, in his various continents. And, and so uh, uh, they had truth. They had a witness on the earth. Men were not blind. Men were not stupid. They rebelled. They rebelled. And, and this we must see. That's the main part we want you to see. From this time, we go into the promise with Abraham and, and, and this, in this area, beginning in Genesis chapter 17. And, and, and this one, we stay until the law came to the children of Israel uh, and, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and Joseph, and so forth, and 400 years in Egypt, until the emancipation of the people of Israel coming up out of Egypt, and God gave them the law. Now, during this time, the great, the great religions were born on the face of the earth, and there are others. I'll be putting up some more names here uh, in our next lesson or two. Uh, and the others were born, and, and, uh, and so... But none of these religions were, were in ignorance. Every one of them came up... In a, in a spirit of rebellion against truth. Now, if we can get that, uh, then the whole scope uh, of, the, of the lectures uh, will then be as we want them to be. If you would open your Bibles, we'd like to teach you. Now, we've already uh, ministered on when God was doing what. 
And, and uh, we, we showed you that God was active from the beginning of mankind until this moment, and God was always present in every situation, and man had to make his choice whether he would serve God or not. Then I gave you a lesson on God looks at paganism, and I gave you the Bible, just the Bible, on what God said about it. Then how our paganism, our pagan religions were born. And then the most widespread of all pagan religions, what we call animism, or pantheism, really. Everything is a God. A piece of wood is a God. A mountain is a God. A rock is a God. And, and a tree is God. Everything is a God. And that there's more of that in the world today, especially among all the primitive peoples of the world, than there is any other religion. And it's a spirit worship and a demon worship that the devil takes the people into. Then we move from that into the Egyptian religion and showed you how, how, how it was born and how it came into being and how God planted a witness there every time. How Abraham, God sent him there. And where Jacob, he went there. And God sent Joseph there to save the nation. And so though they would not serve the true and the living God and made themselves idols, it was not in ignorance. God had a witness there. And the main, the main theme that we are flowing through today, the witness of God is in the earth today. It has always been in the earth. God has always wanted to save man. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to everlasting life. Then we have gotten a hold of truth that is simply very wonderful. Now, after the flood, men began to multiply on this planet earth. In Genesis 9 and 18 and 19, we read these words. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark, these are the, the three young men that came out of the ark, were Shem and Ham and Japheth. Now that's where all the human beings on the face of this earth come from. None of them ever came from monkeys. They all came from these three sources. Now Ham was the father of Canaan. They're going to start giving you their, their lineage. And these are the three sons of Noah. And of them, the whole earth overspread. Now God said that. You see, you just must believe God, the whole earth was overspread because of that. Now, we're leading into Babylonian religion, so we want you to follow us carefully because we're going to show you how it came uh, right from, from Ham, uh, one, of the segment, one of the three sons of Noah. Now, in Genesis 9, uh, 28, the same chapter, verse 28, and Noah lived after the flood 350 years. You have to get these numbers correct, or, or you can't see the, the mighty strength of God as he carried the truth from generation to generation. And all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Now, that was 950 regular years, just like our years, before the flood and just after the flood, men lived a very long time. So from the flood to the Tower of Babel, we're going to see now, was only three generations. Now, that to me is almost unbelievable that in three generations, my father, myself, and my son. Whew, you see, how can you believe that in three generations, people would so degenerate that they would not have faith in what God had said and would not trust him? In Genesis 10 and 6, it says that Ham, who was the first generation out of the ark, uh, and then we find his son Cush in Genesis 10 and 7, was the second generation out of the ark. And then we find in Genesis 10 and 8 that Nimrod was the third generation out of the ark, and it was Nimrod that built the rebellious tower called the Tower of Babel. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? His, his, uh, his great-grandfather was Noah, and that great-grandfather was living and walking among them at that present, at that moment, and no doubt tears was flowing down his face. He said, believe God, trust God. You don't need a tower to heaven. You need a clean insides. The Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And the people says, no, we're going to make our own way to heaven. We're going to save ourselves. We don't want to trust this God that you're talking about. Uh, now, that, to me, it is so difficult to think uh, that Ham would say, he's my daddy, and Cush, he's my grandfather, and Nimrod, my great-grandfather, and he was living, and they would not follow him. So Noah lived to see the Tower of Babel. Now, you see, most people uh, have no idea of the Old Testament. To know that it's in the Bible, that actual years are right here. You don't have to figure them out. They're in the Word of God. So Noah was 600 years at the time of the flood. That is in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 4. Noah lived 350 years after the flood. And so that is Genesis 9 and 28. Now establish those two dates. So Noah did see Babel. It was only three generations from the ark. And so we must know that. And Genesis 11 
and 10, it says that Shem, the son of Noah, lived to be a hundred, and he begot Arphaxed. Now you find it in Genesis 11 and 10. Then in Genesis 11 and 12, Arphaxed lived 30 years, and he begot Selah. And then in Genesis 11 and 14, Selah lived 30 years, and he begot Eber. And so we have 100 years in Shem, and then we have 35 years in Arphaxed, and then we, and then we have another 30 years in, in, the, in Salah, and that adds up to 165 years. Now, Noah was 765 years of age at the time of the Tower of Babel, but he lived to be 950. And, and so he lived 950 years, or 185 years after the Tower of Babel. I don't know what language he got, <laughs> uh, but, but he was there when all the tongues were divided. Imagine going through the crisis that fellow went through. Uh, he went through the flood, and now he went through the division of the tongues of people until there was over 2,000 different languages. There are that many on the earth today, they may have lost 1,000 or two. Uh, but every family had its own language, and they all ran away from each other and dispersed. And the purpose of that was to have a clean seed that could bring a Messiah to save the world. That's the purpose of it, the divine purpose for it. Now, this came through Ham. And you have to watch that family because they, 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 don't, they don't stop at this point. They go right ahead and build Babylon. And that's what this, this, this lecture is all about. Ham's seed brought the, the rebellion of, of Babel at the Tower of Babel. And he was the one in Genesis 9, 22 that was under a curse that looked upon his father's nakedness and no doubt mocked him and laughed him and so forth. And so he was under a curse. And the Bible says he was a mighty hunter a mighty one in the earth. And when you read that back in the original tongues, it says a, a mighty hunter of men. Uh, 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 he was a dictator. Uh, he was a leader. And no wonder he could build a, uh, a, a tower. And he founded Babel, which lengthened out, means Babylon. So the family that was saved uh, turned again away from God and his word. That's the Noah family. The outcome of that generation was a conspiracy of Babel against God and beginning of worldwide idolatry. Now, Babel was also called Shinar, Shinar. In Genesis 11 and 2, it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And, and so it was Shinar, and that's where Babylon was built. Genesis 11 and 4 says, and they said, go to, let us build a city. Not only a tower, a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven and let us make us a name. See, they were trying to be as big as God, as great as God. And so you can see here that it was rebellion. You're not guessing at it. They said, let us build us a city and a tower. And so Babylon, which means confusion, uh, was built in rebellion against God. So the earth was divided. Now let's look at that for a moment. There were only two generations between the Tower of Babel and the dividing of the earth. God divided the earth into continents in order to halt evil and paganism and cause men somewhere to love God. He knew if they all stayed together, they'd all be sinful. They'd all be against him. And so he separated them from that viewpoint. Now, at 239 years later, uh, Noah also saw the continents made on the face of the earth. Let's look at it. In Genesis 11 and 10, Shem, the son of Noah, was a hundred, and he begot Arphaxed, as I was telling you. Genesis 11 and 12, Arphaxed was a father of Selah at 35 years of age. In Genesis 11 and 14, uh, Selah was 30 when he begot Eber. And Genesis 11 and 16 says Eber was 34 years old, and he became the father of Peleg. In his days, the earth was divided. The, the, the scientists call it Gondwana land when it was one united ball and when God split it all into pieces by earthquake, uh, then uh, that was done in the time of Peleg. In Genesis 10 and 25, it tells you the story, the very brief story of Peleg. So Noah, the preacher of righteousness, in Hebrews 11 and 7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world, and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. And so he did save the world, but he lived to see two calamities, which most people never realize, that he lived to see uh, the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the tongues upon the face of the earth, and also he lived to see the disjointing of the land mass and for it to become continents. And, and Genesis 9 and 28, 
uh, it says again, Noah lived 350 years after the flood and that he saw all of these tragedies take place. Not counting Peleg, who saw the earth divided, or Abraham, who received the promise. These were only four generations. Now, you got to get that. Only four generations, like uh, my father and myself and my son and his son. So there were only four generations here from the dividing of the earth unto Abraham's day. Now, can you see how closely knitted together the, the world was at that time and all of this mysticism about, uh, about pagan religions going into the misty past? There is no misty past. We've got the whole of the Bible to show you generation after generation how old each person was and how, how there was a continuous line of rebellion against God. And neighbors, it's the same right now. Think of the millions of people that deliberately rebel against God. Think of the children that, are, that grew up in Christian homes that turn out against God, refuse to, refuse to serve God. They give their hearts to evil. There's a young man in our area where his mother is a wonderful Christian and has followed the Lord all the years. And he grew up right in her household, right at her table. And, and, and he, in my own presence, he says, I'm an infidel. I just smiled at him and said, no, you're just a liar. Uh, uh, you're not an infidel. You just, uh, you're talking out of the top of your hat. Inside of you, you know through your mother's life, there is a God and you're, and you're sure of it. And one day you will have to return to that God. And so now let's look at the scriptures again. And in Genesis 11:16, 16, Peleg lived uh, 30 years and we got Ru. That's R-E-U. And that's in verse 18. And Genesis 11 and 18, Ru lived 32 years and he begot Sirag. And that Sirag lived 30 years and he begot Nahar. And that Nahar lived 29 years and begot Terah. And, and in Genesis 11, 24, Terah lived 70 years. He begot Abraham. And so leaving out uh, the, the, the Peleg at the time the earth was divided and Abraham himself, you've only got four generations uh, separating uh, here. And so there was a very close contact. They knew what had taken place at the flood simply because they had lived so close together. The story was not all fumbled up and the story was not defiled. Uh, they knew the fact. And from the flood, they knew the beginning from Adam. And so right straight down until Abraham, there was a very close unity of the human race to know exactly what had taken place in generation after generation. And so there was only 191 years from the dividing of the earth until Abraham. Only 191 years uh, during that time. Now, God spoke to Babylon. God spoke to Babylon. And I can't give you the whole story of it. But in Daniel chapter 5, God wrote on the walls in Babylon. Uh, and, and, uh, and with his own hand. And the heathen and the pagan priests, they saw it. Uh, they, they, they couldn't do anything about it. Now, these were the people that were so closely related uh, to Noah and to his sons. And in Daniel chapter 5, King Nebuchadnezzar was made insane for seven years, and then God reinstated him to his mind, and he returned to his throne, and it was a miracle, and the whole world at that time knew that it was a miracle. So God was doing something in Babylon of a supernatural manner in order that Babylon would know there was a true God, a true God that they must serve. In Daniel 3, we find the children of Israel in the fiery furnace and the king of Babylon saw the, the fourth man and he said he looks like the son of man, which shows you that he had some kind of a relationship with divinity. He knew there was a God. He knew that that God was great and powerful and he identified him in the fiery furnace. So these people were not in ignorance in paganism. <laughs> they were deliberately there. They, they, they wanted to be there. They, they, they chose to be there. And uh, in Babylon, they had a pantheon of gods. They had Shama, uh, Shamesh, who was the sun god. They had Sim, who was the moon god. They had Ishtar, that you hear more about than the others. The goddess of fertility, which had to do with the deepest of immoralities. And they had Murdoch, the lord of the heavens and the creator, a uh, Murdoch. And, and they, they, they had a date with Jehovah. Uh, they, they, knew, they knew who God was. And yet they, they simulated these other gods. This Murdoch had wings and he carried a sword and a sickle. And they, they had the story of the, of the flood uh, written all about it. And so they, they knew that this thing was not true. They were worshiping it because they did not know God. So they had priests. They had incantations. They had divinations. They had interpreters. They had dreams. They had all of these things. Astrology became one of the, the leading doctrines that they lived by, studying the movement of the heavenly bodies and thinking they could know God and to serve God that way. And so in Babylon, 
They worship the sun, the moon, the sky, the earth, the water, and then strange creatures that they made and fabricated uh, that were half human and half otherwise. And, and uh, all kinds of magic uh, that, they, that they carried on uh, that they knew should not have been done. So the people, and also they worship their king. Uh, they made a god of him and, and, and his kingdom. And so all through this time of Babylon, and reaching into the, also into the, into the Medes and the Persians, these people were in a direct rebellion against God. And the whole Babylonian cult, and that cult reaches unto us to this very day. There are people today that are all bound up in the cults of Babylon, in, in all of the heresies, in, in all of the untruths, in all of the, the sins, and all of the, uh, the, the iniquities that were abounded in Babylon have been carried generation after generation, are found in many hearts of the people today. Uh, and they were astrology people. They said that the, the stars had a relationship with their lives. And in the movement of the stars, they had to preserve their lives by doing certain things. And it's the same thing that you read in your newspapers today. It's the same thing that you read uh, in, your, uh, uh, in, in the little books that you buy about your, your own uh, astrology, uh, astrological uh, uh, a f fortune telling business. Now listen neighbors, you, if you follow that kind of thing, we'll be going the way of those people. God finally had to judge Babylon and judge all that it was. He finally had to see that Babylon was destroyed because of their deep sins and, and because of their deep iniquities. But my whole theme is not really that. My theme is what was God doing when these world religions were born. God was right there. God was speaking through his servants. God was showing himself powerful. God was revealing himself as he is today, one that says, I am not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. And so we hope that you uh, will say, listen, Brother Sumrall, I see this picture plainer than I ever have before. I saw that God is truly a good God. We don't just call him that. He truly is a good God and that he was not willing for these people to, to, to sell themselves to the devil, to sell themselves to lies, to sell themselves to untruth and for them to be doomed and damned because they refused to serve the true and the living God. The arms of God are outreached today to the total of humanity just as he was to Noah and his family. So he is reaching out today to the ends of the earth and he's putting his hand out there and saying, I love you and I want you. And he's reaching into your home right now to love you and to bless you. So why would we want to serve other gods? You know, I, I have with me uh, some of these uh, things that come from that, from that part of the world. Uh, from that part of the world. Uh, uh, when we're traveling in those parts of the world, uh, we bring back the, these type of things that we, pop, we buy. Uh, uh, here is a man that... Uh, has a kind of a man's body, looks like kind of a wolf head or uh, uh, some, uh, some kind of a thing on it. Uh, this was dug up over in those parts of the world. And, and, uh, and we, when we're traveling in them, and as we told you yesterday, or in our former lesson, uh, that the people in Egypt uh, worship the beetle. Uh, uh, this, this is one of them right here. And, and, and here's one of their gods engraved on this side. I'm afraid it's, it's just too small to see. And, and then you can see that it is the beetle. If you can come in a little closer on that, uh, you can see it is a beetle. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and here are some of their little gods uh, here that have, have a very poor resemblance uh, to, to, to a human being. And here is something that was dug up uh, from the earth. And again, uh, even though there's a child uh, in the lap, uh, it, it looks like a wolf or a... Or, or a or some kind of an animal at the top and all those strange things on top. These people fabricated their own gods. And, uh, and you and I, if we're not careful, will be fabricating our own gods ourselves. And your God is anything that separates you from the living God. Let me minister to you. Lord, bless my neighbor right now. Help them to know that these that, that made gods of stone and, and wood and gold and, and so forth, is it's the same as today of making a God out of a house or a job or anything that separates us from our God. And these people realize that God was a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And God is desiring the same today, that we worship him in the deepest of sincerity and in truth. Bless my neighbor right now and help them to know the truth. And may you know the full truth. And may God bless you as you know the truth. May we never go after the things of this world to worship them, but may we worship the true God,
the living God that wishes to bless us uh, today. There are many of my friends that say, Brother Sumrall, I, I, I need to hear this twice. And you can receive this lesson that you've had today along with the other lessons. You can receive them by videotape. If you have a, a video recorder in your home, three-quarter inch, uh, you can receive it that way. If you have an audio uh, in, in your home, you can receive these uh, by audio tape, uh, the entire message as you have heard it, and also uh, in, in written form in a syllabus. They are available in, in a school system uh, that we have questions and answers that you can have and studies. You can also receive them in this way. So if you wish to learn more, then let God teach us more in Jesus' name. Uh, you may write to me, Lester Sumrall, uh, Post Office Box 12, South Bend, Indiana. A zip code is 46624. If you've come to know the Lord today, why don't you write and tell me about it? We'd be so glad to know. We, we are living for one thing, to help you to know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. And to show you that the great, great multi, hundreds of millions of people out there without, that are unchristian are, are that way in rebellion against God. That God loves them and God wants them to surrender themselves to him. And that there are no gods. The Bible specifically says that there are no gods. There's only one God and that God is Jehovah. And we want you to realize that and to serve the true and the living God. It's been a great joy having you with us in our study. We hope you'll come back and see us again. We have other studies on the same theme. And we pray that you will be with us when we give those also. And until we do, we say may the good Lord wonderfully bless you and uh, smile upon you. And may you be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And may his, his blessings flow out to you. And we always tell you this, that when you feed your faith, you starve your doubts to death. So... Let your doubts die. Thank you.